into positions of hopelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God Bless America. No, no. soundboard with me um it's an extra spooky halloween episode of <laughs> pda mashed up this week with the horror vanguard hi i'm jake flores anders lee is here anders lee here uh alex anders Patek. lee fear right we should like do sp- spooky names <laughs> um uh how do i not have one for myself i've been doing this for years <laughs> jake burez is here <laughs> Andrews is that Leaf people here. booing you or or yeah that's what that is but it's very scary to me yeah <laughs> and it happens all the time I'm living in a waking nightmare every time I do stand up um Alex Patak is here Alex Patak fear <laughs> okay <laughs> cheating but technically works um I received the assignment uh on late notice <laughs> I didn't have a horror <laughs> name ready <laughs> Come back to me next week. That was Andy's idea. (laughs) Candy. Candy Gitlets from the Antifada. Candler's Lee. Just want to pop them in your mouth. Candler's Lee. Like spooky candles. Um, (laughs) And our friends, the Horror Vanguard, John and Ash, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. Uh, Yeah, I'm John. I go by the Lit Crypt Guy online. Uh, Or the Lit Crypt Guy for Halloween. Uh, and my co-ghost, Ash. How you doing, man? Uh, uh pretty good. I'm Ash, uh, at Durovania on Twitter, uh, Slashly works. I guess that one's pretty, pretty easy. Yeah, I like yeah, thank it. You so, thank you so much for having us back. Yeah, of course. Um, so if right off the bat today, we are going to talk about Squid Game. So if you have not watched it and you are worried about spoilers, or you just don't know what the hell it is. Maybe don't listen. Uh, spoiler <laughs> alert. Uh, squid Game, Squid Game, Squid Game. I don't know, I'm just giving people time to turn off the podcast, but... What um, about Axlix, Patek? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, there axe we go. Lix? Yeah. Axlix. Like, like, a- like a murderous axe. And he mm-hmm. licks it. <laughs> Yeah. You have to play along, because it could be a benevolent axe as well, and you just have to lock that out of the equation. Yeah. Axe flex. You like you're flexing an axe? Okay. Like you're flexing an axe. The thing that I'm we spooky all... and hot. <laughs> well, the axe would also be your arm. You have axe arms, and you're flexing your axe arm. How about that? Has that ever Scared been Scared yet? <laughs> Guy with axe arms, has that ever been a monster? God, it's it never been be. done. It seems so basic. It's right there. It's right. been t- called too frightening for television, <laughs> and we're trying it here today on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, it would be incredibly inconvenient outside of murder time, but when it's time to start chasing teenagers around, you don't even need to pick up your axe. Your arms are the axes. And you can- really, Thank what other goodness. job can you get? Yeah, it's a it's an Edward Scissorhands style affliction. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah right. like lumberjack or axe murderer, I guess. Will anyone love me with my axe seals. hands? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, or like uh, well, I was gonna say it's like an Edward Forty hand style affliction, but that'd be even weirder if he just taped them to his hands. <laughs> Uh, and that's somehow like incredibly sad just like a guy trying to be some kind of horror monster just with duct tape yeah come on, come on it's gonna work <laughs> <laughs> i'm a beast i'm an unholy beast jake gorez okay i came up with it all right let's time to start the show oh, yeah. everyone um, <laughs> nice let's go <laughs> if you're unfamiliar with uh what john and ash do over at the horror vanguard i highly recommend listening to it i enjoy it quite a bit i enjoy film and film analysis and uh 
specifically the Marxist kind and I in specifically the genre of horror films. And so I thought it'd be cool if we did a mashup and we talked about something that's hot this holiday season. But um, I didn't want to like kind of scrape too much into your uh, wheelhouse because I know you guys do like horror mm-hmm. horror. And so I, Squid Game occurred to me because it's not a movie. It's a TV show, but it seems like it's going around. Everyone sort of watched it. It's like the most watched thing on Netflix. And it's also not like horror with a capital H. Like it's not gothic. It's not vampires. And and it's not a, you know, one of the classic tropes. You kind of say it's more maybe sci-fi or a thriller or something like that, but it doesn't seem too far away. It definitely seems like something we can pick apart. And it's for sure hella anti-capitalist, I think. So I'm curious off the bat what y'all's take is on this show, Squid Game. I know you, uh, you're you pretty good at stating up front at the top of your episodes some grand, like, you know, uh, take about things in relation to philosophy and stuff like that. So do you have any 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 huge take on this I might not have seen coming? Oh, oh shit. Ash, did you... Did, did you... You don't have to do. Did you write? Did you write a pricey, Ash? I always do. Oh How wow! Not <laughs> Squid Squid Game is is this thing is like a lunatic text. I love it. This is my favorite part uh, of every horror vanguard. So I'm very excited. <laughs> I didn't know if you were going to do it, but oh man, Hell that's yes. like that's and legit. A lunatic okay, text wow. is a good thing, right? This oh, it's super uh, good, super okay. good. Yes. The weird, the yes. weirder shit gets, the happier I <laughs> <Yes>. am. <laughs> Just to inject inject the Squid Game into me. That sounds like a different kind of show, though. <laughs> uh, there have been a lot of frankly embarrassing pieces written about Squid Game. Game rants, Squid Game, colon, nine things that don't make sense. The Washington Post, the success of Squid Game illustrates the benefits of globalization and free trade. Wow. And, and Gizmodo's just absolutely ridiculous comment. North Korea praises Squid Game as a critique of capitalism in a complete self-own. Really? All of, all of these <laughs> fucking horrendous, uh, but why? What is the catalyst that flows from the past and shapes the banal, ideological, and vapid commentary we're faced with today? Capitalist realism has hemmed in our future to create an eternal present, a moment in which the past never happened and the future isn't coming. It distorts the causal flow of time and sends history back onto itself. Those vapid articles are a reflection of this distortion. Capitalism has taken away our ability to connect with the past and in doing so has shut down our ability to see the president as it really is, a squid game. Utah Phillips once remarked, yes, the long memory is the most radical idea in this country. It is the loss of that memory which deprives our people of that connective flow of thoughts and events that clarifies our vision, not of where we're going, but of where we want to go. The landscape of America is potmarked with so many unmarked graves. The genocide of indigenous peoples, Reagan's dismissal of the AIDS pandemic, and union burying grounds from Everett, Washington to Mount Illinois or Mount Olive, Illinois haunt the land. Though individual graves are marked, our collective consciousness bears hardly a marker for the dead that fought for us. Squid Game has commented on the test of human morality. Are you ethical enough to not play is a misguided and neoliberal approach to the problem. The reason we must play the squid game is material. No one has ever died of black lung because they wanted to. The economic and material conditions of reality forced this upon them. Squid game makes this into a metaphor because, as Zizek says, we cannot connect to the truth of our desire. And so the pervert art of cinema must obscure so that we can see clearly. The only way out of the squid game is to invoke rule three. We organize, we struggle, and we build union power to end this game. The ludic perversion of capitalism only ends when working people of this world stand up. Strikes at mines, strikes at mines, the Kellogg strikes that are ongoing, and the IATSE strike are just a taste of the memory of this strength. Under neoliberal capitalism, all labor is just a squid game. The only answer is, what's stopping us from playing by our own rules? Whoa. Whoa, takes. Clap, 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 <laughs> clap, clap, clap. clap. <laughs> uh, just, just one objection there. Um, you said no one has ever wanted to get black lung. My great-grandfather was a method actor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who, 
wanted to be in, oh, in a minstrel man. show at the time, you know. He, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He wanted to get really into it, but before he did blackface, he wanted to be, you know, to have the inside black, so he got, gave himself yeah. black wound and died. But uh, other than that, I stand thing, thoroughly corrected. Good <laughs> lord. <laughs> That's uh, even... Yeah, Squid. The the kind of HV line on Squid Game is just that. Um, is just that gif of like I know writers who use subtext and they're all cowards. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they're, like. Uh, it, it, the, the, but the the thing that's most interesting about the show is the extent to which the critical response is trying to kind of paranoid read this text and go. Uh, the thing that it's very obviously about, about how rampant capitalism is literally going to set us to murder one another, it's not that, guys. Don't don't look so... And it's like, <laughs> what, what, what has happened? What has happened? Ash is completely right. What's happened to, to kind of like the critical cultural industry that can look at a text, which is obviously and immediately about uh, the, the kind of vicious depredations of contemporary capitalism and go, yeah, but here's why it's good, though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, th th this is what the world is like. But what the show doesn't tell you is um, how many jobs the Squid Game creates. You didn't right. think about that. <laughs> right. Did yeah. you see how the squids enjoy their iPhones? <laughs> That's a big part of the show. Uh, I don't. I, I don't I, think. I don't think any of those people who are uh, machine gun uh, machine gunning innocent people in the face. Uh, I don't think they were paying rent, were they? So. Right. Not thought about that, hey, have you? If the policeman, who, the policeman who infiltrated the island had had an iPhone and not an Android, then he would have actually been able to send and transmit the messages to HQ. Yeah. And this whole thing would have been over. So I have a lot happen. of opinions about the entire policeman arc. But, uh, but <laughs> while we're discussing the genre, because Jake brought it up, this is this is the thing I am most stuck on, which is I, I've seen people pass around the article that this show was written ten years ago. Mm -hmm. So anybody writing that it's a it's a Hunger Games clone is off the mark. And while that is true, uh, and, and this is in the question of is this horror or is it not? I don't think this is a horror. This is a very specific and well established genre that we know and love by now, which is the twisted game genre of film. <laughs> <laughs> established probably by Battle Royale, maybe maybe before that, where you put characters in a slapstick ridiculous situation where they all have to kill each other and they turn <laughs> to the camera and they go, "Why?" Why do we play this twisted game? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait. wait. Battle Wouldn't Roy Saw be what about Saw? Because that's kind of on the uh, on the Saw board. absolutely in the twisted game genre. Yep. That's also horror. A major player. Well, that's well. This this is my point though. Is that the 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 text to look for? Because this one is openly the the poverty battle royale. <laughs> you're shipped in. <laughs> you're not just random middle schoolers who the government hates. You're you're. Uh, <laughs> You're the uh, excess capital workers. You're, you're shipped in because you're you're su superfluous. You're not needed by society. So all the 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 author decisions that are outside of the very fun uh, red light green light murder scenario are the ones you have to pay attention to. The 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 parts where you can vote and go home is where all of the big writer decisions are being made. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, um, Battle Royale is certainly a, like a genre in itself, but I'd say it's overlapping in horror. Like, uh, you would find this in the horror section of a blockbuster if they still existed, I think. But yeah, totally. Like, the the, the Hunt, that, have you seen that one? That's a Battle Royale oh, style yeah. thing that came yeah, out yeah, recently. Yeah. But it's like, it's a commentary on, uh, you know, American politics or whatever. And then you got like The Game. That one's kind of not horrorish it's certainly more of a thriller the classic michael douglas thing where he runs around town screaming and taking notes out of clowns mouths and stuff like that <laughs> i would horror. say cube is a twisted game remember cube yes. cube's great Oh, totally yeah yeah this is definitely cube ish for sure um you got, you got something like um the belco experiment as well yeah um never seen which it which is um J uh, James Gunn film from back in the day, oh, but it's cool. like, uh, and these things kind of cross the genres. But like, what the 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 horror element comes into agency. Like, what is the what is the scope and purpose of the game? 
So like we just we just covered all of all of the Saw films over on Don't HV, remind me. which was <laughs> we're fine, we're fine. We, we've we've been through a lot. We've been through a lot. That was like, like your I, own I, personal jigsaw punishment. I heard yeah, you like basically yeah. watching Saw quick, films. Quick refresher on the Saw. Do they uh, make money from that? Do they get money at the end, or they just get to live? Yeah, you yeah. just get you just get to live. You get okay, put yeah. in like you get put in like the 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 Rube Goldberg machine that like mm -hmm. twists all of your limbs to like face backwards because you you didn't appreciate your life because you yelled at the asshole who cut you off in traffic one day. Um, but like your your choice, your agency is like, do you, do you want to chop off your arm or not? So your agency is like super limited, and the whole thing that kind of kind of we joke on the show that like all movies are horror movies. And it's become sort of like not really a joke. I think we sort of sincerely believe this now. And yeah, it's not really a horror movie, uh, Squid Game, but it kind of is because the whole point of it is debt subtracts agency from your life. Hmm. The whole point, the whole point of being poor is that you don't have choice in the same way that someone who is financially secure does. Um, and, and when you get right down to it, that's, that's the choice of like, are you, are you literally able to afford to stay alive? And that is the setup of a horror thing, right? Right. Yeah. It's interesting to me that this was written, you said, 10 years ago, and it, it didn't get produced until recently, and I can't help but think that Parasite had something to do with that, because uh, obviously this was going to get an international viewing, but until Netflix saw that Korean movie about how capitalism is bad can make them a lot of money, uh, they, didn't, they didn't bite on this. I feel like that that definitely it, it, in sort of an ironic way like the Korean anti-capitalist critique film um is is hot right now for if you are a uh film financier. Yeah, totally. There's this there's this whole story going around of like the guy who wrote Squid Game, you know, 10 years nobody picked it up. At one point he was he um was going to have to sell his laptop in order to like keep going and people were like isn't this it's so inspiring. It's so inspiring. You know, if you work hard, you too can make it. And I'm like, you have brain worms. Like, how do you look at this story and go, ah, yes, the, the answer is greater neoliberalization of the work ethic, right? If, if, if you just believe hard enough, all of the material restrictions upon your kind of creative agency as a writer or a comedian or a filmmaker, they'll just disappear. They'll just become like, like smoke and will kind of be blown away by the fact that you you tried hard enough and you kept going and it's like 10 years of not being recognized of having like what is a, a shit hot idea like that really fucking works for most of the show um and you you get 10 years of a door slammed in your face and people go i'm so inspired right now <laughs> listen if you win enough squid games you too can sit with the vips in the human furniture room <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like crazy because like no one is looking at this from like the Western point of view and going, we could have had this person making like more of these stories for the last 10 years. If even looking at it from the point of view of like, uh, you know, having identified some incredible new storyteller or something, which, you know, these like heroic stories that we tell about creators and capitalism kind of tend towards, which are kind of bullshit in themselves a lot of the times. Maybe this is the only thing he ever makes, you know? But, mm -hmm. like, we're sitting here acting like this is, like, one of those, you know, J.K. Rowling things where, oh, they wrote it in a diner <laughs> on a napkin. Wow. Incredible. The way that, like, the American way of looking at things and this, like, direct 180 opposite Korean anti-capitalist thing overlap with each other in a way that, like, fries everyone's brain from our own perspective and makes us see a thing directly beating us over the head heavy-handedly as, like, somehow the opposite of itself is really fascinating to me. I kept thinking about Parasite when I was watching this because it's, like, uncanny. Like, there are two things from Korea that have happened recently that are, like, really heavy-handed if you have put on the they live glasses at some point in your life and are able to conceive of a critique of capitalism or whatever. Um, and it's very funny that like American audiences watch both of these things and go, what does it mean? You know, because it's like <laughs> you literally interviewed like when they interviewed Bong Joon-ho after Parasite came mm -hmm. out, 
he just says like all of my films are about capitalism and then the fucking interviewer just turned to the screen and go i guess we'll never know what it was about you know like, <laughs> what the fuck are, are you, you talking about north korea <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so I guess one thing. Look up uh, Neil Brennan's Squid Game to see his. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> doesn't have any, yeah, doesn't have anything to say about it. Oh it's man. Coward. Uh, blocked. I'm afraid otherwise... Jake is gonna get him. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucking blocked. Otherwise, I probably would have made fun of him for this because, like, the, he did that last time. And I mean, you know, it's fun to make fun of Neil Brennan, but all he is doing is saying something out loud that uh, is is the fucking party line over here you know um i guess one thing i'm curious about though is like i don't know if anyone can answer this if anyone's like well versed enough on korean politics but like why is this thought coming out of korea right now or you know not right now in the case of squid game recently as in the last 10 years but why why is there this interesting critique of capitalism it's specifically in what's going on in film over there because i don't i like korean horror but i'm not like i don't know it well enough i'm just every time i see something like this or like old boy or or bong joon ho mm-hmm. stuff i'm like kind of thrilled by it but uh i don't i don't have the context like like what's going on where they're coming to this conclusion that's doing this thing it's so interesting because it's like what one thing i like i think you guys were touching on the beginning of this that uh is also really frustrating is that the thing that americans seem to not be able to see is the this the lumbering shadow in the background of this story of like united states imperialism and how it connects to what we are doing over here americans tend to see things as like these isolated stories and think of states as just these sort of free floating competing things in the world that aren't all in relation to like our own government and society and stuff like that um can you i don't know can you speak to that do you know you know anything about korean film that might explain is this like a trend i mean is this is this surprising that this happened or is it just a one guy or is it one guy or is this or is there a lot of stuff like this happening right now so i can I, uh, yeah I, go I can, on I can answer that but backwards okay because uh, I, I have no idea like i'm not like a korean politics guy but uh i do live in the united states which is unfortunately the beating heart of global capitalism and I think the reason why we don't see parasites or at least as many parasites or squid games coming out of the States is that we have like going on like what, seven decades of crushing anti-communist propaganda that, that, and like that has been coupled with like assaults on union organizing and like all of this far right push to like get rid of critical race theory is their new thing. And like, it is this, this constant effort to ensure that we cannot remember our past. No, nobody, nobody here knows, or I hope nobody here knows like a child who like had their hands torn apart in a loom, you know, like, like weaving in a factory or something, but that's because like union, union workers in the IWW fought and died for that. Well, that's the, actually the guy with the ax hands is his origin. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's his origin story. <laughs> yeah. He, he was- <laughs> Anders' grandfather was going after a part in a loom role. <laughs> um, uh, but maybe, like, to think about this from the Korean point of view, um, Korea, South Korea is, is um, an exceptionally wealthy country, but mm-hmm. has enormous, colossal levels of personal debt, um, a lot of, like, cheap credit in its economy. And uh, huge amounts of wealth disparity, like on 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 levels with America, if not more serious. Um, it is also, um, you know, deeply enmeshed with the U.S. military, right? You know, the mm-hmm. the, the the division of Korea, um, the Korean War, the the absolute uh, U.S. obliteration of much of uh, the land that is now the DPRK. Um, like, so there is there is this there is this idea that like. Yes, this is a story that's very specific to uh, South Korean society, um, but which doesn't make it any less kind of universal. There's a great uh, quote from uh, Bong Joon-ho about this, mm-hmm. where he says that he was trying to make something that was about the problems of Korean society. 
and was a little bit surprised when it like blew up all around the world. And he says, well, you know, it turns out we all live in the same village, the village called capitalism. And it's like the particularity of a certain situation, I think, allows you to see a universal shared condition, right? It's very telling that all the v- like loads of the VIPs have American accents, right? Yeah, like that's right. that's 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 super revealing about about what this is. But like, I my think the favorite problem- part of the show, by the way, I don't know if we're discussed that. Either, right? <laughs> <laughs> all these, you know, the the tourists fly into town. Of course, they're rich Americans because it's like who else are they going to be in South Korea? They're the people who made their money selling weapons or something during the Korean War. Right, I so guess this like, could be in any third world country you could have made Squid Game and just right. copied and pasted oh, yeah. it. And, and there's, a, there's a Chinese billionaire in the room who's just trying to get into the frat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, sure, they have, like, I mean, it's also, like, obvious, like, yeah, they've got the American investors, and you've got the local guy who's, like, sort of the go-between, who's bought into the grift, and then you've got everyone being exploited, so it's, that could happen fucking anywhere in Latin America, any Asian country, the, the, like, the United States has got this sort of thing happening all over the place, historically, and that's probably why it's just so funny because like it like but why are americans watching this and going like you know like this is setting off people's like unconscious cultural zeitgeist part of their brain where they're like yeah this is so true but also i'm completely blind to being able to explain like why it's true so i have to write some weird think piece about how it's about like race or something just like off the mark or whatever it makes a lot of sense to me though yeah um andrews you what were you saying well just like the so the i know we're, we're going to touch on this but the strike that uh the main character had been involved in that he mentions in the show was based on a real thing in yeah. 2009 mm-hmm. in south korea and uh in real life it was there's there's strike breakers like the south korean police raided the place beat strike breakers i think people died and uh all, all of the people who had gone on strike accumulated debt. They were like sued basically mm-hmm. for costing the company money. And so they owe this extreme amount of debt. And so to Americans, it's like that, that I feel like that wouldn't in 2021 anyway, that wouldn't happen here. Right. We've got strikes going on now. There's all kinds of retaliation in the works, but we're at a point where we're because of the sacrifices from people and like the IWW back in the day, um, that sort of thing doesn't happen here anymore. It might happen again if true. But at the same time, like uh, we don't, we take that for granted, right? Because it seems like, from the from at least from watching this, that people in Korea um, understand that the government is more repressive when it comes to um, anti capitalism and just threatening the status quo in any way. Uh, but unlike America, um, they actually get why that is right uh and i think some of that has to do with the fact that north korea is right there and you know if you look at the opinion polls according to some opinion polls a majority of south koreans want reunification with the north um so they understand that capitalism is a sicker system than we do and it also in some ways is uh more brutal over there I have a few things to say about this. One, have you seen the video of the 2009 strike breaking? No. Because it is the most Tekken live shit you have ever seen. <laughs> Guys in full swaki are jumping out of helicopters like onto workers' heads from like 20 feet up. And they've got like these pipes and they're just wailing on them. And it's real. It's like an actual, you can find the video. It's Holy insane. Holy shit. Uh, um, the thing to keep in mind, and I do want to uh, throw this out, and I think this is very important to say on the podcast, I am not a Korean expert. I do not know about Korea. Do not email me questions about Korea. You know more <laughs> about Korea than I do. Don't talk to me. Um, the thing you have to consider about why these films come out is in the context of the Cold War, North and South Korea are like the testing lab for the ideologies across the world, where you have North Korea's economy, the, the, during the Korean War, the entire area is destroyed. Both sides, especially North Korea, America is just throwing napalm over the whole thing. Like 90% of their buildings are laid to waste. Um, and 
after the war, you have a complete redevelopment and uh, investment by international powers with the Soviet Union backing the North and America and Europe backing the South. And in the 60s and 70s, the economy of the North is doing much better than the South because the Soviet Union is a a lot closer than America and they are they're for whatever reason able to just prop up the country a lot better. Um, but there's a an understanding while this is happening, the South Korean economy takes off in the 80s. South Korea is just like an open dictatorship for this entire period up until 1987. So there is no delusions if your family has been living there. We're the experiment for capitalism. They're the experiment for communism. And uh, without going into any of your analysis for the DPRK that I'm sure everyone would love to hear <laughs> and um, make everyone in the world mad, um, the the situation that you're in is that uh, without the support of the Soviet Union, the economy for the North completely collapses, and they are where we are now, whereas the uh, victorious Cold War allies of the capitalist extended universe have won the mighty game and uh, they get capitalism on steroids in South Korea, which is why they have the best internet in the world and why the debt for the average person or uh, the debt in total, I'm sorry, is 105% of GDP. According to this thread you sent me, Jake. Oh yeah. That's a lot. Which is insane. Yeah. They're getting what we get on steroids. Yeah. So everything's hyper stratified. So it has the same weird, confusing lens that people put over the United States where it's like, look how rich we are. And it's like, well, we'll define we because that's big way the system is shaped. Right. It's just like the guy uh, who owns Samsung has a pool you can do a bong in somehow. Um, <laughs> it's awesome to be him. Uh, but it makes total sense to me that Americans can't analyze this stuff because our entire cultural project since the 1950s has been, you don't live under capitalism, you live in democratic freedom. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. all these ana analysis of capitalism that Koreans understand, Americans don't know what to do with. It doesn't look like anything to them. Yeah, I think and like... Uh, just to add one thing to that, like po the North Korea post the, so post the fall of the Soviet Union, one of the things that significantly contributes to to their overall like decline decline of quality of life there are sanctions imposed predominantly by the united states and other like global bastions of capitalism so we we are actively trying to comment on a south korean movie from the country that is currently actively destroying north korea or at least making it incredibly difficult to live there and that this this movie and our commentary of it has to exist in conversation with this kind of like geopolitical game being played by the people who rule our country. Yeah, and just to kind of pick up on something Alex said, like, there's a really good book called The Jakarta Method. Yes. Um, oh yeah, we we had him on the which, show. Uh, yes. it, it, just such such a good book, and there's the bit right at the end where he's talking to someone who's involved in kind of like leftist or socialist struggle back in the day, and he says he asks them. You know, how, how did we win the Cold War? How did we win? And he says, well, you killed us all. Mm -hmm. Like, like if we're talking about this as like the Squid Game as a model for geopolitics, the Cold War was not cold by any stretch of the imagination. No. Right. Like the CIA funded uh, militias and death squads in Indonesia that killed literally millions of people. Like coup shit everywhere. Uh, this idea of, of it being like uh, uh, the, the aim was was to, to, to equate freedom with the with anything that was like even vaguely liberal or reformist was dangerous and was a threat to to the kind of great game and it's like uh to, to 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 say that like the the cold war and you're quite right korea was run by a dictatorship and then by like massively corrupt neoliberals for for literally generations it's like this was done solely to secure the interests of global capitalism Right. And global capital is based in the states, but is borderless. Right. It's kind of inherently liquid. And, you know, if you think about uh, I think it's incredibly useful to think about the Cold War as literalizing something like Squid Game or Parasite. Right. This is this is why this is barely even fiction. This is this is a, yeah. like pe pe people were fucking murdered uh, and not and not in small numbers either, like hundreds of thousands, millions of people um, in the most kind of creative or banal ways that the, the CIA and the U.S. military could come up with. 
Um, you know, how did how did the US win the Squid Game? Killed everybody else. Yeah. Killed them all. Maybe there is something to like why this is a phenomenon in the United States because horror taps into the subconscious and like this is a horror movie essentially about a like a check cashing station or something like <laughs> very American but for Americans like that you're just that part is subconscious it shouldn't be it should be conscious like we're saying it is for Koreans but it's like pushed down into your into your your dreams where you're only allowed to think about it ideologically as being like a fucking problem or a reality or something that you have like a tangible hold on and could uh, engage with in any way or whatever um let's walk through the movie a little bit or the the show so everyone uh kind of listening can get a, a framework for what we're talking about so like this this writer now that i think about this, this is kind of interesting if the if the writer wrote it 10 years ago that was immediately following the strike because the strike took place in like 2009, 10, 11, like that era. Um, so immediately following that is inspired to write this main character whose thing is that he's an ex auto worker who then, um, I can't remember the exact word, but there was like a, a, like a precarious freelance style job thing that you were forced into if you were one of these furloughed auto workers. Who, uh, not furlough is not the word, but like, uh, but post strike was saddled with all this debt. And that's his origin story. He, it's destroyed his life. He's like lost custody of his child and stuff like that. And he's like kind of a hilarious, just like nihilistic, I'm going to be poor forever person who's like caught in this system. Who, he loves uh, horse racing. Yeah, he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's into <laughs> racing horses. <laughs> it's like gambling constantly and shit. Um, he's drunk. He runs into an ambassador of the game who is clearly, clearly now we know after watching the whole story, like they've cased these people. They went around and found the most debt ridden mm -hmm. people in society guy, um, sort of pitches him the game by playing this weird children's game with him that I guess is like, you know, rock, paper, scissors or something in Korea. It seemed like it was like a local affectation where it's like pogs like he basically plays pogs with the guy <laughs> and the guy is so good at pogs <laughs> yeah. and it's part of the show that he can't beat him and every time he loses a game he gets slapped in the face <laughs> i i i really want to know what that guy's job interview was like you know you go for a job at this corporation it's like before we get into this Tell me about how you used to play Pogs when you were a kid. And he's like, finally! <laughs> <laughs> My gifts can shine. Or, or alternatively, he started out shit at Pogs, but by uh, racking up homeless people around the country, he developed into one of the top players in the nation. Well, that's kind of interesting. That's an interesting question of where did that guy come from? Because, like, so what happens is the guy... Um, my, my favorite line from that first episode is because he, he, he when he loses, he doesn't have any money. So the guy goes, well, instead of paying money, I'll just slap you. And so he plays Pogs enough with the guy that he makes a bunch of money, but he's got the shit beaten out of him and his face is all fucked up. And he goes home and he tells his mom, like, oh, it's cool. I made a bunch of money getting slapped today. He, like, doesn't explain it. And uh, it's pretty funny. And then later on, it turns into a thing where he gets the fucking card, like a la the game. And then he, you know, figures out, oh, I can go do this further and and be part of this weird elaborate you know uh most dangerous game type situation or whatever um but once he's in it the way you get into it is you they pick you up in a fucking weird uber they gas you you get knocked out and then you wake up inside of this building somewhere and then you start playing all the games and you discover all the people around you are also like like the like Cube, like all these other movies. They're who knows? They're just random strangers. Wow, that's so weird that they're random strangers. Until you start to discover that they are heavily metaphorical and they're all stand-ins for various parts of society. And then we watch society as a metaphor embodied by like a couple hundred people implode in on itself and compete with itself and you get to see all these you know very obvious metaphorical heavy-handed things happen like uh an elderly guy is he gonna survive do we treat elderly people okay in this system that we work in no most no. of the time <laughs> you know <laughs> um there's like i think my favorite 
part of the the show and all oh, those the most fucked, fucked up part, part where they really like kind of did this TV, 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 TV thing to me and made me jump out of my chair and go like no fuck you tv show that i like and i'm watching <laughs> on purpose was um when they get to the this the dice game which is an inherently fucked up game where you pick a partner and then you realize that one of you has to die and everyone starts to really debase themselves for survival and probably the most evil matchup of the whole entire thing was there's a guy who's a capitalist he's like a stockbroker business guy and he's really interesting because our main character really admires him which is you know weird but that's also part of capitalism is thinking like you know i gotta root for this guy maybe i'll be him someday and um so the stockbroker guy gets matched up with ollie the immigrant who Mm -hmm. is i think from pakistan and he's like really he's a real sweet guy he's got a couple of fingers missing from a, a you know factory accident he's helped a lot of people at this point through the game um and then i guess to me what it read metaphorically was when when the stock wrote ollie beat him like he won dice mm-hmm. against him and then he was way better at marbles <laughs> yeah or yeah marbles <laughs> businessman <laughs> <laughs> yeah which is like stupid because you can't really good at marbles i guess but he um he beat him but then stockbroker guy like meta gamed him and cheated him out of the situation and it and, like just fucking completely harvested him like he he survived by tricking this guy out of a situation, which I guess to me it just seemed like so, like such a good uh, placeholder for all this stuff happening in real life. Because like, even if you do the things that they say you're supposed to do, even if your life is a little Horatio Alger story and you work really hard and stuff, they're still not going to let you have it. You know, the system is still set up to to where those people, the people at the top, can benefit themselves to that uh degree or whatever and like uh, so then you know that stuff goes on and happens and then we get through the the game but let's get back to something where the fuck do the people who work for the game come from because it seems like they're also kind of trapped in the deal too it doesn't like they're doing it out of the like you know like in their off time or whatever so i I guess i was wondering (laughs) like what do you do? You think that they also played the game and then survived or something? Like we kind of see that being alluded to as the cop breaks into the the storerooms where the records are and stuff like that. I don't know. Do you think that plays into it as a metaphor? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the Squid Game is basically Disneyland because you have like you, you in, in Disney you don't see the carpenters, the painters, the janitors, right? All of the people who like necessarily need to maintain that that uh labyrinth and hellscape of a theme park and it's the same way in the squid game right like that weird like dr seuss room that they all have to walk through in between games like i don't know how many like woodworkers and painters and electricians you would have needed to assemble that thing but all of these people are made invisible just like they are in theme parks and that speaks to like i think ollie i'm really glad you brought up his character because like uh, like migrant workers from Pakistan, like they they face uh, in like Saudi Arabia, South Korea, like brutal, like borderline slavery levels of working conditions, and people will like take away their visas when they go someplace to work. So like this the scene where he like steals money and like crushes his boss. I'm just like, fuck yes, you get it. But yeah, I don't know. Just some thoughts on that. Yeah. Um. All right, you go. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say the anonymity is kind of the point, right? This isn't like uh, there's there's a kind of phrase that's been I've been trying to write something about kind of capitalist ideology. And the phrase has kind of like been buzzing around my head is like, it's not personal, just business, mm-hmm. right? It's not per- it doesn't like it, 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 in a way, does it really matter who these people are? Because really, they're not they're not kind of people, right? This is what happens when you get integrated into a kind of capitalist system of exchange. You, you know, you're not really a person. You know, and it's like, yeah, you might not have the, the the whole point is like when when there is the possibility of you becoming like a subject, right? You take off the mask, you you kind of recognize the other, you look the other person in the eye, they will fucking shoot you in the head. Because as soon as you become a person, all of this kind of like systemic class antagonism can be renegotiated, right? When you when you kind of have that 
uh, kind of moment of Hegelian recognition. You know, you look at you look in the eyes of the other, right? They'll shoot you in the fucking head, right? Because the whole point is it's not personal. They don't want it to be personal because it's the point of personal interaction where you construct solidarity, right? Where you can kind of like construct kind of connection with others. So like the whole point of keeping them atomized, keeping them like it's it's like they're not allowed to be people. You don't want them to be people because that's when people are dangerous. Yeah, yeah, this is this is alienation, right? Like we we cannot see ourselves in the other. And our our identities have been made so neoliberal that we're all so like one of the things about this that for me kind of resonated with horror is that like the, the space between the anonymized nature of contemporary capitalism here in America and wearing like a mask and a hood and being like one of the uh you know Gestapo dudes from the death game is is so tenuous like the border from that space um and that's yeah i don't know to me the the question of who are the workers really gets to that article you pointed out in the beginning and why that was so funny which is nine things about squid game that just (laughs) don't make sense (laughs) because the understanding is a lot of it doesn't make any fucking sense it's a beautiful dream tapestry of course, like you would have a hard time finding labor to be your death squad. Uh, just numbers wise, it can't just be winners of the game because there's more of them than there are players. Uh, but and I, I another thing I found online is people saying that's an, uh, an homage to the fact that uh, the ROK has mandatory conscription for young mm-hmm. men. And so if you're forced to join the army. And isn't this a little bit like that, mate? Um, but to me, it personally registered the fact that these are just more workers. These are people without their own agency. And they hammer that in a few times when the infiltrating police guy becomes one of the workers, one of the mask dudes, and he's shooting people in the head all day. You get see when they go to bed, they get a very nice message from the computer that says, great job helping out with the game today. Make sure you get your rest so that you can show up exactly at eight in the morning. <laughs> you, you have, like, uh, you've earned five Bezos bucks today. Congratulations. <laughs> You're yeah. a prime employee. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess they're... they're like scooping out people's organs on the side. They're clearly just other desperate people. Oh, I forgot about that entire subplot. Yeah, so they all just answered like a fucking Fiverr thing or whatever, or like a mm-hmm. Craigslist ad. Um, something I wanted they're to hustle, grind, zoomers. They're all eighteen-year-old <laughs> boys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it is like a horror film. So like, don't think about it too hard because now I'm thinking like, wait a minute, does anyone ever leave though? Like, because that is that a job? Someone just you meet at a bar and they're like, oh, I had this really weird job last month, and then he, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man last summer was crazy <laughs> i assume it's something you get when you're coming out of the military <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. That, it's like a bonus with like yeah mercenaries and stuff yeah. um like maybe you're just like signing an nda or something or yeah I'm you're sure just <laughs> you just have ptsd the second this show good the, the second this show implied they've been playing a squid game for 20 years and no one has found out about it, I was like, yeah, all right. <laughs> That's fine. There is holes all over this entire system. Well, for sure. the squid game is the monster. So that's another thing I wanted to talk about, because like I, I watched Freddy Krueger the other night and I was kind of struck with like I watched the original Nightmare on Elm Street and I was kind of struck with the absurdity of that movie. Like I remember watching it when I was yeah. a kid and it was really scary and watching it. As an adult who lives in the year 2021, I was like, what? Like, this is insane. Like, we're supposed (laughs) to be afraid of him because he wears a weird fedora and, like, has a stripy (laughs) shirt. None of this makes any sense, and yet somehow it it worked back then. And then I, like, listened to an explanation of, like, like, Wes Craven just said that a drunk guy scared him when he was a kid and he was wearing that hat. And, like, that's it. That's the entire explanation. So there's, like... There's plenty of room for, like, weird artistic interpretation and loose ends to exist in horror because the point is not for it to be, like, completely bulletproof and cohesive. The point is to just draw on a vibe known as fear, right? And so something I was thinking about when I was watching this is, like, when usually in horror you've got one person who is a human and so it's scary because they are like us, 
but something has gone wrong with them and they embody this thing that needs to be kind of cold from the pack of humankind. Something, you know, scary that's living within a person who went crazy. And the reason that it's so scary is because it's like, um, it's, it's like something that's like irreconcilable. Like we don't like to think about why Freddy Krueger became Freddy Krueger. Maybe if we think about it really hard, it reflects on something that we did. Like we drove a guy out of town and burned him to death or something, but it's, I don't know. It's very individual in nature. And then with something like this, I think this story is kind of unique. I'm struggling to come up with like horror films that are like, like on the same level as this, because like, if you want to think of this, like a horror film, the monster is so many people that it, makes you kind of pull your hair out and go, how could this possibly be happening? And that is what's kind of cool and scary when you're watching it is like the, the scary idea is you almost like join into this system. Cause you're like, there's so many people involved in this. It couldn't possibly be something that evil, right? Because it would never, you would never be able to get away with something manifesting evil. If it, if, if thousands of people are involved in it, because we're human beings and we live in society with each other and in relations to each other. And then that's, that's the, that's the twist, right? Is that no, that's very, very, very possible. Um, and then that's the thing that you sort of reconcile with. Um, but is there any, like, has anything else ever kind of reflected social relations between people as the source of horror like that in your, in your uh, viewing history, I guess, as the horror vanguard, or is this is this unique? I don't know. I I I can't believe I'm going to do this, uh, but we're going to need to talk about Saw. Uh, <laughs> no. so, we just can't escape. I'm so sorry, because uh, like the whole the whole point the whole point is like uh, all of that nicety, all of that like so, social relationship, social being. Uh, like this is a kind of very straightforward Marxist point. Is that like social being is dependent upon social circumstances, right? Material mater- material conditions determine our social being, right? And if we think of ourselves as having a kind of intrinsic nature of being like basically good people, the kind of horror is to is to be shown that like that self perception is a complete fabrication. You know, the like you will do you will do horribly fucked up shit. It's like um, the, the marble game where our good human protagonist. Is lying and gaslighting this this dying old man. It was like for for me watching that was like that was that that was like that was a difficult thing to watch. And you see the kind of cost, right? The horror is not what might be done to you, but what are you going going to do to yourself because you think that's going to let you continue existing, right? Um, like that's that's where the horror comes in. And like this is this is this is kind of like. Uh, what the Saw games were, were kind of based on, right? You put you put all of these different kind of stereotyped people in a house, and you go, you change the social conditions, and you go, right, we're going to see just what kind of social being you actually have. You think of yourself as a good person? Well, if you... It's like you put the wolf in the trap, and it will tear its own leg off to get out. Uh, but you make that into, like, a creature which has opposable thumbs and a vast, limitless imagination, and, like, people will do fucking horrible shit to one another uh that's that's the kind of the nexus of horror here i think a- ash do you, do you agree or have i overstepped by bringing up saw uh, uh you you agree but i would also add that we need to talk about goo in order to understand squid game uh so it, it's 100 percent about social being but part of that is the the kind of deep state of alienation that we're under right we don't recognize community anymore right it's very shattered and very fractured uh horror loves playing in that space right um invasion of the body snatchers the blob the thing um all of these movies that are about people being dissolved into some kind of like galerte substance and then being reformed it's, it's a way for us as the viewer to question what masses of people are to begin with, right? This is this is the fear of of like a gothicized populism and a fear of the mob being played out through Squid Game. Mm. 
It's uh, also a bit like zombies, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Mate. Those because are... <laughs> zombies are all about, you know, the human side of zombies is what you would do to other people if you had free license to kill them. And then the zombie part of zombies is all about what you want to do but have been held back from doing by society. And so the second you get the Z virus, you kill your own wife with your mouth or whatever, you know. <laughs> um, and this movie's that, but you know, for money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I thought the scariest part of it was when there were three people left and 450 of them are dead. And on the couch, I was like, well, you got to get that money now. <laughs> 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 like, I'm just ready to play by that point. <laughs> Yeah, I mean the end. Like the further it got to the end, it was like it was pretty funny to watch because something that occurred to me that I thought was funny was just when they get to that point where three people they have like this dinner set up where they get to eat like mm-hmm. steaks and wear tuxedos and stuff like this, and you're watching it, you're like, wait a minute. At the beginning, they kind of implied that everyone could win the game, and then like you built all this stuff knowing that three people would make it to the last round and then two people would make it after that. Like that's kind of <laughs> fucked up. Yeah. It's weird. Cause the game masters have this weird concept of equality. And the point of the game is that everybody starts on a level like playing field and they try to even it at certain points. Like there's a part of course, where they are trying to get across this like huge, uh, man-made Valley basically. And, you have to step on a glass that's either, um, you know, extra strong or a normal piece of glass, and you're gonna just fall through it. And there's a guy who's a glazer, and he's looking at it, and he's like, "I can tell this, uh, which one's which." And they shut down the lights because that's an unfair advantage. But like, people are all different and equipped with different skills and knowledge, and like, obviously, there's isn't the point to weed out the strongest people. Like, they're it's 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 weird if they're and I, I think this is a, a good um, aspect of, of Squid Game, but the, the fact that there's this inconsistency with the people running the game where they view it as a meritocracy, but obviously that, that they contradict themselves because it, it can't be, right? Somebody has to be better than the other people. Right, because they that also... was the most political part of the whole thing yeah. because mm-hmm. it, th- while this stupid game is happening and you're watching it being like, this is so unrealistic, this could never happen, the people who run the game who are seeing the same thing you're seeing are like, we got to make sure it's fair. So the best one wins. And you're like, in what situation is this finding the best of anything? <laughs> They're playing red light, green light, or you die. It's not <laughs> helpful. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean the best, the opt- optimal man is good at red light, green light, cutting out honeycombs, playing marbles. <laughs> and I forgot the other ones. Uh, jumping Glass on ass hop right pogs <laughs> but even with yeah, pogs, pogs yeah pogs. yeah, yeah, yeah. Pogs. <laughs> they're trying to create a super soldier that can do all five of these things but no one has been able to yet <laughs> um but no th- this is this is totally b- bound up in its political critique right it's not it's mm-hmm. not a mis- it's not a mistake it's not like a it's not like a a, a, a you know these i get i i find like the worst thing about contemporary cultural criticism is to like view everything as like a hermeneutic puzzle that has to be decoded like horror horror or thrillers or science fiction or speculative fiction of any kind is not realistic it's not the point to kind of map everything onto the external world world and be like what did this mean it's like sometimes stuff is just stuff it's sometimes it's just a symbol right what but does like, c3po like... represent in the real world oh. <laughs> is, it british? is it british people yeah the, the, the worst kind of british people um <laughs> But like uh, it, it, this, this kind of line that they take about meritocracy is absolutely a kind of critique of neoliberal democracy, right? We're offering you choice. You know, you can even vote to leave. But it's like, what if this illusion of choice merely offers kind of structural rearrangements of the same fucking awful status quo? Uh, what an unrealistic premise! Who could possibly relate to that? To having <laughs> to to being constantly told that you live in a democracy with you where you're free. And anyone can, can succeed, whilst at the same time it seems a shadowy uh, structural force has arranged your society in such a way as to maximize and extract wealth out of your suffering. Uh, you know, totally unbelievable. I couldn't relate to it at all. 
uh, I give this a three out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> three, three out of ten squids. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess as we round down here, um, I think we've probably worked our way through the the metaphor. If you don't get it by now, you'll never get it. I'm sorry. You're too. <laughs> America has destroyed your brain if you haven't figured out. <laughs> what squid games about um <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple of details that i guess i'm still kind of curious people's takes on like the one of them is the defector from north korea and what she possibly meant in all of this and her relationship with like the christians and the atheists and stuff like that um but mostly i'm just curious about what we think of the end because i think we were talking a little bit before the podcast started and uh I fucking loved Squid Game. The end was bad. Like, it didn't make any sense. He just... Sanders didn't see the last 15 minutes, and we were like, good. <laughs> Better <laughs> that way. Okay. Yeah, because our, our protagonist makes it. He valiantly defeats the stockbroker capitalist guy, and the uh, the cool defector chick from North Korea just dies. Like, she just gets stabbed, and, and I think she dies when one of the glass panes explodes, and it just, like, mm -hmm. she reveals later that she's been bleeding the whole time and stuff. And, they made uh, the fucking bridge explode. I couldn't believe that. <laughs> it's not related to it. Like, for all these elements of control you have, you're gonna explode a glass bomb next to all the players? <laughs> <laughs> I think they become excessively more... Like, they sort of gave up the pretense that it was fair at one point, mm -hmm. reaching that. Because, like, the, I mean, we're, we're talking about this inconsistency thing about the meritocracy. Like, it's kind of funny because there was that one there was that one game where, like, there was an odd person and it was the poor chick. And everyone thought they were just going to kill her. And then they all got back from their round. And she's just like, they let me, li like, live because they let me skip around because, of, you know, this, the owners of the place said that. They don't believe in people being like outcasts or something like that, which is like best such... actor in the show, by the way. She was fucking she's the great. best in the whole thing. Yeah, she was so cool. Um, she died though. Uh, spoilers. Um, you already made it through the whole podcast, but um, but yeah. So at the end of the, he makes it through the the game, wins all the money, is not happy. All his his life is a you know an O Henry story at the end of it, and he's like. He has nothing he, to do with the money because the only person he cared about at this point, his uh, his family is all alienated. His mom dies. I think his, his, the rest of his family with his children leave to, like, America or something. And then he just, like, goes and gets a Final Fantasy VII haircut. <laughs> <laughs> and we're left with the, then he tracks down the the old guy who we discover planted himself in the game to play the game for fun which is a cool reveal i it's it, I, the first game because he's saw because yeah. it, he's literally <laughs> oh God, saw then <laughs> fuck <laughs> oh yeah jigsaw did that too yeah um I don't, but I don't really, like, I don't know, their interaction at the end when he's sort of explaining, you're my Ganbu still, and, uh, you know, just enjoy what happened. I don't know what I, what to glean from it. Does anyone have any thoughts about the ending? I do. It's a bunch of fucking bullshit. <laughs> 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 that guy, so that guy uh, uh, supposedly created the squid game and like built it from the ground up and he used to live in an alley but then has a remote battle island that he's created and worked in for 30 <laughs> years but because he's a brain tumor he wants to be in the squid game to feel the rush before he dies and that's why he's not at the VIP meeting but he loses the squid game and this is what really gets me they don't shoot him oh right which means he's effectively not playing the squid game because everybody else gets shot in the fucking head <laughs> that's right because they shoot him off screen and you just assume he died but i guess in mm. reality we understand he was going okay i'm leaving the game now just shoot next to me <laughs> well we had a good run <laughs> so <laughs> let's wrap it up now guys uh, on my but my former bond villain island base <laughs> 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 but isn't that the most like Jeff Bezos ass thing to do with your infinite money, right? You buy into this myth that you lifted yourself up from your bootstraps and now you're in a position where like you could use your infinite, you know, vault of cash to like 
you know, house all the homeless and hunger, you know, do, do a million good things, pay off this debt, but no, you're going to like, you know, jigsaw test people's inner moral compass by making them play pogs until they die instead. Yeah. Right. right. I, I, I think thematically it did line up because on paper, the point they're making is that even the ultra wealthy are as trapped in capitalism as we are. And it hollows their lives out in the same way it hollows out yours. But then in the story, <laughs> fucking yeah. throws the whole thing into left field if that guy hit the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess he's slumming it. That's what he's doing. Is he's, Oh, yeah, yeah. He's bored being rich. He probably wore an animal mask and fucked a bunch of people when he was younger. And now the only thing that <laughs> really makes him, like, excited at all anymore is pretending to be poor, which is what a lot of rich people do but then they can always right. call a rip pull a rip cord and like get out of a bad situation so so uh it's not real i mean they need I, a I did... squid game season too i think that's what it comes down to this yeah. this is mm -hmm. what this is what really stuck out to me so he talks to that guy he makes a valiant stance no i'm against the squid game and even though i won i won't use my squid bucks because they are <laughs> covered with ink. And he goes out into the streets and gets a Final Fantasy head cut. And then in the last scene of the show, instead of going on a plane to move to Los Angeles to annoy his ex-wife until he dies, mm -hmm. which we're all supposed to be like, that's a good use of your money. Um, he instead turns around because he gets a phone call that says, don't come back to the squid game. And he's like, I'm coming back because I'm a man and not a horse. And we're expected to believe he's going to kill his way to the squid game again to end it, um, which just shows to me kind of a, a, on a fourth dimensional angle. Even the show Squid Game cannot escape the squid game because they had mm -hmm. to plant a oh, hook yeah. for season two even if it ruins the show. Yeah, that is kind of sad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. It winds up, you know, internalizing the same neoliberalism it's trying to resist as kind of an object, right? The body of the show beyond just kind of the things that happen on screen, right? Like if you make a TV show for Netflix, it 100% is going yep. to end the final episode on a cliffhanger because Netflix knows if your show is popular, season two probably never season three but if you're ultra popular like stranger things they'll keep grinding this stuff out till the money stops rolling in and if your show tanks whatever it's just another tanked netflix product that no one ever talks about yeah. and, and right. you know it's gonna happen right it's become it's become uh, i think arguably netflix's biggest ever show and it's like mm -hmm. so this is so we've got this one one incredibly solid interesting story and i can't wait for like cephalopod game all of like the shit spin-offs <laughs> yeah and all of like, oh my the, god the, yes the crappy the asylum Im cinema imitation. squid game <laughs> that's kind of what happened with like the matrix where it i think that the story with the matrix was that it was like originally supposed to be three movies and then they made them con compress the entire three movies into one movie but then the one movie was so successful they were like all right do three movies and you go but you made you took our whole story and put it in the mm -hmm. first, which is why it's <laughs> all fucked up because of the production process so that's like that's why there's vampires in the second one <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's so, so sad because this fucking show is so resonant but then mm -hmm. it's probably a downhill from here i guess we got what we were going to get out of it you can only mm -hmm. you're only allowed to see the ghost of the thing for a brief moment in the middle of the first season and if you, you know what it'll probably be like this weird thing where like the next season is way better funded but is a worse story which happens oh yeah often wasn't somebody saying that like this what was the ratio of Squid Games to Chappelle specials? <laughs> money. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it cost, what, uh, three times more to make Chappelle's new special, something like that? Than the entire season the entire of Squid this Game. show with, like, all these fucking was people in it. Was possible? <laughs> he just asked for a lot of grim. money, I guess, because he was doing his swan song about talking about trans people, and... He also dresses like he's in Squid Game. You guys notice that? All right, I think I'm running out of shit to talk about. 
I bet the next one is going to be what's well, from the guy who survived and him. I forgot his name already. Sorry, but uh, he's Gion. Gion. He's trying to destroy it. But the B plot is going to be from the point of view of the workers who are like cleaning up and shooting the people and doing all that great gross stuff. Finally, here's my I don't know how to square this with anything else we've been talking about, but I have to discuss it on the podcast. Do you think the VIPs are like that because they're bad actors <laughs> or because all of their lines are directly translated from Korean? <laughs> uh, I, I I don't know, but I do know that that human furniture room smells absolutely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just a bunch of old white men who go like, fuck ass! That was my big number one pick! <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think it's up to you, the viewer, to choose which one of those worlds you want to live in. Which I want to believe that they are so rich and out of touch that they say fuck ass and stuff like that. It does kind of work, right? Because right? if you've ever been around, like people who have a lot of money they can just talk like however they want and they say crazy things yeah like that part where 69 dies so he goes i'll do 96 Whoa. 96 is like 69 <laughs> but upside down yeah. Yeah. and you're like okay scrooge mcduck <laughs> 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 but it's like it's like you know in a way i was sort of like okay this is this is this is what this is what a, Kore a korean production thinks of rich americans and i was sort of like doesn't seem that's what it's like it doesn't seem too far <laughs> off i've got to be honest Scroo scrooge mcduck gotta get his beak wet yeah, you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it could have been less accurate i would have given them plenty of leeway if it was weirder i mean it's not it's considering how little information you may have had to work on. That's probably pretty close to the guy who owns Halliburton or whatever the fuck. He probably says fuck. They ass. did make them sexual predators, which I found to be accurate. Very accurate. Probably yeah. pretty accurate. You know, well, these people probably come to Korea. They probably met this guy. He's probably not even an actor. He's probably really the guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's the CEO of like, Toys R Us from the did 90s they, or something. Did they kill him? Because you don't see him after the scene where he is uh, like unmasked and forced to admit to what the Squid Game is. He's on the ground. I I personally took that he received a James Bond judo chop right, from the like, policeman who already is defying logic in all of his moves he makes for his entire arc. I thought that was the least realistic part of the I whole like thing. I like the policeman, but... Oh, I, I, but was after did the people uh, who worked the game kill him though? They killed him, squealed. right? Yeah. They fa they chased him. He almost got away with like swimming out of the fucking thing with a bunch of pictures. No, no, no. The uh, the rich guy. He's talking about the CEO. Molest. Yeah. Oh. Mm. I think he's in the last scenes. I think I think he gets to watch the end of the game. I yeah. think he would be upset after being you know beaten up and anyway. I don't know. I think he died. I think they killed him. Yeah. Was it, is it a disgrace in rich pedophile circles to not... <laughs> oh, they've taken off my tiger mask. The one rule right. we have. I don't know. Maybe. Also, but those people all know who the fuck each other are, right? Like, the, the community oh, totally. of people with that much money is very small, and they all still have their really distinct accents and... It's like a bill. Is it? Is that you? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I am giraffe man. You know, <laughs> this probably happens to this guy every ten days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like it's not just Bill. It's Bill Gates. Like it's someone who everyone knows. <laughs> like I know who you are. That's Elon Musk underneath the rhino thing. <laughs> it's a very distinct way of carrying himself. All right, well. Happy Halloween, everyone. Uh, society's a squid game, and so on and so forth. Uh, Zizek sniffing noises. I think we did it. Thank you, Horror Vanguard, for joining us and breaking down this delightful piece of cinema. Can you call it TV show cinema? Prestige <laughs> television? Hell yeah. Um, horror? Question mark? Maybe? Battle Royale? Um, science fiction? I don't know. Um. Yeah, where can our listeners listen to you and find out more of your stuff? 
Uh, yeah, come listen to Horror Vanguard. It is it's a horror film. It's a horror film podcast about friendship and communism and why those two things are great. Uh, we are we are available wherever good podcasts are uh, distributed to your ears. Um, you can find us uh, find the show on Twitter at Horror Vanguard and on Patreon for bonuses for the Discord for all of the other spooky stuff that we do. Uh, patreon.com slash uh, horror vanguard as well uh, Ash did I miss anything I think that that about covers it and yeah come 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 join in the, the squid discourse the squid course online uh, at the liquid guy and at darrowvania as well cool alright uh, let's do our plugs and get out of here I am going to be at fest in Gainesville on Halloween weekend I'm playing Jacksonville I think on the 1st of November right after that and uh my album's out on november 5th on stand-up records and i think that's all i got other than our regular podcast stuff we have merch for sale we have a discord and a patreon and everything check it out support the show anybody else at anders lee here on twitter dursley one instagram uh, a lot of strikes going on strike tober we got some strike funds we'll Put in the show notes, uh, don't buy Kellogg's. Uh, I know we have a lot of farmers listening. Don't buy John Deere at the moment. And Mm -hmm. uh, also, last strike fund I want to plug, uh, students at Howard University have taken to occupy a building um, in protest of uh, exorbitantly high rent and tuition costs, housing and tuition costs. So if you can help them out, please spare a dime. We'll put those links in the description. You can find all of my wonderful works on Twitter at Patak Test Kitchen. That's P-T-A-K Test Kitchen. And back my new and exciting Kickstarter, Squid Game the Game. (laughs) Would you like to play Rocks, Paper, Scissors, but a little guy shoots you at the end? Squid Game the Game. (laughs) We're raising $10 million. Be sure to find us there. Cool. Yeah, $10 million. Cool. Um, All right. Well, it's finished. Bye.